Hi everybody, this is lecture number one of three. We got a three hour block of lectures tomorrow for Thursday. Uh, it is week four, the Thursday Marathon series. And I'm gonna start knocking these off and this will be kind of a short one, but we're gonna start the stomach. That's why I wanted to keep this separate. We're gonna start the stomach after this one and stomach disease. Ending the esophagus right now. We have to talk about Zenker's diverticulum. So it's also known as a pharyngeal pouch or a hypopharyngeal diverticulum or most commonly known as a Zenker's diverticulum. It is considered a esophageal diverticulum. Uh, so remember the difference. I'm kind of using a new setup, but kind of like these markers. So oh, it's hard to change colors is the only problem. But let's say this is the intestine. Okay, so if you get if you get something coming out, like a appendix, I can't erase that, but if I could erase that there. So if you get something coming out and it's got a lumen as well, that's called a diverticulum. A polyp is something coming in. Uh, and it may or may, it, they don't usually have lumen, but they do have a blood supply. Um, those are polyps. Those are the ones that tend to become cancerous in some people. Uh, so make sure you know the difference between a diverticulum right there and a polyp. Okay, and yep, so it is, it is the Zenker's diverticulum is a pathological outpouching. You can consider it a herniation, as in, some people call it that as well. But it's it's in an area where your anatomy is probably a little shaky, and we're going to need to go over that. Uh, it's generally speaking, it's kind of close to the upper esophageal sphincter, uh, but specifically, it's in an area called Killian's triangle, and you probably remember that. Maybe some of you remember that back from Gross too. Uh, sometimes it's called Killian's dehiscence, and it's a triangular patch of tissue that in some people it can be congenitally weak and you can herniate your esophagus uh, right through that. Okay, and I think, let's see, I might have another video making some noise here in a second. No, maybe I'm okay. Um, yeah, so Killian's dehiscence, let's talk about it, Killian's triangle. Uh, it occurs between two components of the lower pharyngeal constrictor. Uh, specifically, the lower pharyngeal or the inferior pharyngeal constrictor muscle, uh, that's got an AKA, that's called cricopharyngeus muscle. So let's take a look how that is. The two components are, the one superior is called the oblique portion of cricopharyngeus, and the, the inferior portion is called the transverse portion of cricopharyngeus. They have some AKs from Standring, which is a board book, uh, pars oblique, pars fundiformis. Um, but but what, is the, what does all that stuff mean? That's just the inferior parts of the pharyngeal constrictors. There's the upper part, there's the lower part. And there's nothing lower than the transverse portion is as low as it goes. Sometimes the picture is always better. So all of this is actually the inferior pharyngeal constrictor, all of this stuff. But down here, it gets a little funky. Um, this is the inferior most region of the inferior pharyngeal constrictor, and that's called uh, the transverse portion of cricopharyngeus. Uh, and this is cricopharyngeus, the, uh, the oblique portion of cricopharyngeus. All right, and here's that weird tissue. I kind of highlighted it green. Uh, and so this is kind of triangle, like if you, if you extend this pharyngeal raphe down. Oh, I guess I can do that, right? I got my little thing here. Um, it makes a triangle, so they call it, they named that Killian's dehiscence. And people who have a congenital weakness here, especially if they have one of the motility disorders, like like a nutcracker esophagus, when they swallow something, and you have super high pressures, you can start to actually herniate your tissue right out of that region. Um, and so that's what it is, and that that's a lumen. It connects right up to the. Uh, the esophageal lumen, and yeah, it can collect food and water and all sorts of stuff in there. Okay. 
uh, tissue uh, in between everything I just said. That's the oblique and transverse fibers of cricopharyngeus. Forms Killian triangle. It's a weak spot. Everything I said already. Um, and there's kind of a side view of how you get a little out pouch in there, like I drew. And you drink liquid and stuff, and it starts getting caught, and it starts rotting in here because it can't get out, and can bacteria can start growing. It can perforate. Some people it perforates, and you can get a, a thoracic infection from that as well if it perforates. Um, but yeah, so it's an abnormal weakness. Diverticulum herniates through there, as we said, especially if peristalsis gets really too high, like in people with like a nutcracker esophagus as a particular problem. Here's another side view. Uh, they tend to occur more on the left, the post here. Some of them you can actually palpate, but most of them are back here, uh, post here, leftish, a little bit to the left. Um, but there's the Killian, the Killian's dehiscens or Killian's triangle would be this region right here. And some people it's strong, they don't have problems, but some people it's weak, and you can get this type of a herniation from that. Right, so there's the oblique portion, cricopharyngeus, there's the horizontal portion. Why is it called cricopharyngeus? Well, because both of these attach to this thing. Remember that? That's the cricoid cartilage. Right? All right. That's right, I don't, I can just turn the page with this new system. I don't have to delete stuff. Uh, how do you make the diagnosis? Sometimes you can palpate the little sac back there. That's called Boyce's sign. I think of another slide coming on that. Um, Boyce's slide, uh, Boyce's sign. Uh, but you have to order barium swallow. And I mean, you're going to send it to the, uh, the GI doc for this. It's interesting, though. This is an interesting region uh, because who do you refer to if they have trouble swallowing? Do you refer them to a gastroenterologist? Or do you refer them to an eyes, ears, nose, and throat doc? Ooh, that's a good question. Eyes, ears, nose, and throat doc, uh, they typically don't go down past the laryngopharynx. That's their, that's their domain. When you get into the actual esophagus, uh, then they hand off to gastroenterologists. So this is a gastroenterology problem. Uh, but when people are swallowing, sometimes you just don't know. Right here is a barium swallow on this girl, and you can see she swallowed 10 swallows of barium, and they film it under fluoroscopy, and it didn't take long for a big sac to start filling up here, and only a little bit of barium is actually sneaking through right here. Right, so this is, that's not good. That's a Zenker's diverticulum. Okay, there it is on the A to P. You can see it. You can see the, the barium got stuck in there. There's a fluid level, the barium's in there. We can tell this is an upright x-ray because of the fluid level, and very little of it is getting through there. Okay, it's not, I've, done, I've tricked, uh, tricked people with that question before. I've said, it's, is this an acquired condition or a congenital condition? It is not, you're not born with this condition. Just like spondylolisthesis, you're not born with a spondylolisthesis, right? That famous study where they x-rayed 500 newborns, which is crazy, I know. Never be allowed to be repeated again, but they didn't find a single spondylolysis, spondylolisthesis. Uh, same kind of deal here. However, we think there's a congenital weakness, just like in some types of spondylolisthesis. They're born with kind of a weak pars, and these are born with kind of a weak... Killian's triangle. Um, it typically, once it gets formed, uh, it doesn't grow and grow and grow like a tumor. It, it kind of can be stationary. And it tends to favor the left side. It's posterior, but it tends to favor the left side of the neck. Uh, what's the epidemiology of this? That's more common than Marfan syndrome. About 0.06% uh, of the population, so Marfan's was 0 0.01, so it's what, about six times more prevalent. Um, it usually shows up in older people as the tissue really gets soft and uh, not very strong anymore. Uh, so seventh and eighth decade of life is where it shows up. 
men are affected about twice as much as women. The Rolling Stones symbol, right, works pretty good for a zinker's diverticulum uh, because here's the upper part. So this is the, I guess I'm in the wrong color, uh, but that is the uh, superior fibers or the oblique portion of cricopharyngeus. I wonder how hard is it for me to change colors. How do I change colors? Do I have to right click? No. Did it once before, I don't know how to do it. Oh, there, just click. Um, there we go, just click, left click on it. Um, yeah, so here's the oblique portion up here. And then here is the horizontal portion, which would be, it's getting pushed out by the tongue, but, uh, and then this part right there, that's the Killian's triangle, and that is the actual herniation through Killian's triangle. There's the old Rolling Stones. They actually just released an album, I think, and I've heard there's a decent song or two on that thing. Uh, but there they are. They're still still going at it. They got some great albums back in the day. There's a nice picture of it. So there it is. Killian's Triangle has herniated, and we got Zinker's Diverticulum sticking out through it. And there's that. There's another Barium Swallow. Any risk factors associated with this? Uh, yeah, so what this these would all increase your chances of getting a Zinker's diverticulum. Uh, so people with the chronic inflammatory muscle diseases, I think Dr. Davis probably taught you all about those. Uh, so polymyositis, dermatomyositis, uh, they're rare, but they do happen. Uh, so they, that uh, inflammation tends to affect Killian's triangle and make that tissue really weak. Any other fibrosis diseases uh, which cause fibrosis uh, can also do the trick and cause this condition. And the fibrosis uh, would make the esophagus really stiff. And therefore, when you swallow, the pressures are really, really high in fibrosing conditions. And um, yeah, if you have any congenital weakness, it would herniate right out. So they're associated as well. And yes, we talked about the motility disorders, two of them in particular, the nutcracker esophagus, uh, and then uh, diffuse esophageal spasm, uh, huge risk factors, right? They have very strong peristaltic contractions, and it can, if there's a weakness in that triangle, it'll herniate it right out and cause the diverticulum. What about the symptoms? Really hard to tell apart from a lot of other conditions. Dysphagia, maybe odynophagia, some pain there. Uh, frequent regurgitation. I mean, that, this can be seen in GERD patients, right? Odynophagia and dysphagia if the esophagus gets all scarred up down there. Uh, frequent. What about halitosis, though? That's kind of a new one. That's a giveaway if they have GERD symptoms, but they have really rotten breath. Like stuff is rotting. I'm not. Everybody has a little bad, bad breath, but I'm thinking like really bad, uh, rotten halitosis. That's a sign of it. And if they keep that food that gets infected, it can be burped up, and you might choke on it. It might go down into the lungs, tracheobronchial tree, and cause an aspiration pneumonia. So you don't usually see that with GERD patients. There's a famous surgery, probably the best spine surgery there is if you have to have one of these things. It's called the anterior cervical discectomy fusion. I guarantee you, you're going to have patients come in with this uh, that have failed ACDF, or maybe they have something else. They say, oh, yeah, I have ACDF. So you got to know what that is, right? Now, that's the Peyton Manning surgery. Uh, that football quarterback, his career was over, tried three surgeries, almost like Tiger Woods, tried three kind of silly endoscopic laser surgeries. Those things never seem to work. I don't have much luck with those things. Uh, and went back to the time-tested ACDF, and boom, wins a Super Bowl. All his power came back in his arm. Very successful surgery, but they do, that surgery uh, entails going in through the front of the neck, 
And you can get some swelling and inflammation in the front of the neck. And it squeezes the esophagus uh, to the point, uh, makes it hard to swallow. And if you have a predisposition uh, for for the Zinker's diverticulum, it'll, it'll happen. Here's an ACDF. It's real, really simple. They come in through the front. They take the old disc out and they put something in there. There's all sorts of, there's artificial discs they can put in, which I don't recommend. Uh, the best one is probably to take a chunk of bone out of your hip, use that as a graft and uh, sculpt it. You know, orthopedic spine surgeons are great carpenters. They're, they have to s shape things just right. They look at the space and measure the space and they have to shape something. Um, so that's a piece of bone out of the hip. And then that will turn into bone because it's bleeding, it's fresh bone. That will fuse this segment into one segment. And then you put a stabilization. You can't put a cast on it, but you can put a plate on it. There's what it looks like on radiograph. What are these things called? First quarter. Did I have you for spinal? I don't think I had you for spinal, right? Somebody asked, by the way, about uh, if you could get a copy of my endocrinology slides my spinal anatomy slides, yes. What I will do is I'll put those up. Try to remind me. If I don't get them up by this weekend, somebody remind me again so I don't forget. But I will put a uh, new folder up uh, on your uh, on your web, on your um, on Brightspace, and I'll dump them in there uh, so you can take them. I think you have access. I don't know if you have access after the quarter closes or not, but that way you can download them if you want them. Um, okay, so that's ACDF. That's Peyton Manning. Oh, I forgot to tell you. What are those? Uncinate process is good. Somebody remembered. And they make up what joint? Remember the German guy? Joints of von Luschka. Luschka joints. Joints of von Luschka. What about the clinical findings? Uh, there are probably none. You're going to probably just have to order or refer out to a GI doc. Uh, but occasionally... It, if you go, uh, if you go between the thyroid cartilage and the SCM on the left, you can check on both sides one at a time. Right, you don't want to uh, have them pass out on you. Um, sometimes you can feel a, a little splashy, bouncy tumor there that you can splash. You can feel the liquid in it, and that's called the Boyce's sign. Boyce's sign. Uh, other things that you might, when you're palpating around between the SCM and the uh, in the trachea and in the thyroid cartilage, you can feel bumps on the thyroid. But sometimes they're really big, and they're usually they could be cancerous, uh, but they're usually not. They're usually something called a thyroid nodule. So thyroid nodules are benign. They are considered cysts. They're filled with a jello type material. And they're usually no big deal. They are found in about 3% of older people on exam. Autopsy studies of people over 65 have found 50% uh, of these. About 50% of people have at least one of these things. So they are quite common. Uh, they can become cancerous, though. So you have to; these always have to be biopsied. Uh, so these are bigger numbers than I was thinking. Uh, so adults, uh, when you have a nodule on your thyroid, about a 10% chance it could be cancer, so that's not a good thing. If you find one on a child, 25% chance that thyroid nodule is cancerous. Uh, hopefully it's just that cyst and not, not cancer. Uh, there's usually no pain when the bump is little, um, but later it can. these nodules can actually grow into the uh, back into the esophagus and push on the esophagus from the outside and cause some dysphagia and and trouble swallowing and dysphonia as well because the voice box is right there uh, right so you might get a hoarse voice because of these things and they could cause stimulate a cough as well so thyroid nodules there's a nice picture of thyroid nodules kind of look like raspberries in this drawing or blackberry or raspberry I don't know okay uh, what about the complications uh, what can go wrong? About 1% of these diverticula, uh, they can become cancerous as well. And it's usually not a good cancer. It's that squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, so it's kind of different than the one that's made up of gland. The adenocarcinoma is more common in, with the Barrett's esophagus. Uh, they can, as I said, they can perforate. 
and uh, it could, if you start, it, it taps into a blood vessel, it could start filling with blood, and you could start coughing and spitting up blood from this thing. Uh, if you're a aspirin taker, if you take lots of aspirin, um, some can get stuck in there, and acid, salicyclic acid is an acid, and it can erode a hole in the diverticulum, and that's not a good thing. You could get thoracic infection from that, um, and all sorts of things. And then, as we said before, it's a, that little sac can catch food and drink and water and things like that, and you get yourself an aspiration pneumonia. The ultimate treatment, if it's bothering you, if you have dysphagia, driving you crazy, uh, you just have to cut it out of there. Well, you don't. You send them to a, a surgeon who specializes in that, and they cut it out, sew it up. Hopefully you don't scar too much. Um, if you scar, you probably end up having dysphagia. Uh, but remember, there is a chance it can become cancer, so it's probably not good to have it in there for too long. And there's open surgical techniques, and there's uh, endoscopic techniques. It's, it's no, not really a big deal. It's just like an overnight. It's like a discectomy. There's usually an overnight stay in the hospital, and that's it. And, yeah, that's the deal with that. All right, so I'm going to cut this one off here, and we're gonna. I'm going to decide how much. I always say I'm going to cut out all this anatomy so we can get more diseases, but I tried that one chord, and it just didn't seem, because it seems like you don't remember your anatomy that well in your physiology. So, But let me think about that, and I'll make this its own video, because I think we do have a one-hour block of GIGU in the afternoon, so this will be that, and then I'll do it. The double will be next, and then that'll take care of that. All right, see y'all later. Hi guys, Dr. Jillard again. Let's get to part two and three of this lecture. It's week four. It's Thursday. It is spring 2020. We are still on lockdown. Got extended till... When did it get extended till? June 1st. Man, we've been locked down a long time. Anyway, here we go. Hey, we made it to the stomach. Exciting. You guys will be excited to know as well that I just cut out some very, very hard stuff because you're supposed to already have that in uh, GI physiology. So I'm going to have it on YouTube. So I strongly recommend you read that stuff before boards because I've heard it's been very useful. But I just got to get to more diseases. But let's, I will give you a little intro here in the stomach here. You think you know your stomach anatomy? If you go through this hole right here, see that underneath this membrane? Where are you? What space are you in? What's the name of the passageway? Any, any general surgeon doing a cholecystectomy or taking out the gallbladder knows it. Well, that's the lesser sac underneath that. And where's the greater sac? Greater sac is everything else. The peritoneal cavity is basically the greater sac. And that's the lesser sac. That's called the foramen of Winslow. Foramen of Winslow. All right, so foramen of Winslow's got some AKAs, the omental foramen, epiploic foramen. Yeah. All right, so we're going to be talking about the stomach. You know the anatomical divisions of the stomach, right? Here's a stomach, kind of a median sagittal plane of it. Fundus is up here in this region. Oh, I got my little tool on here, fundus. Cardiac region is right in here. This is the anatomical body of the stomach, where the rugae live. And then this is the pyloric region, which has two parts, pyloric antrum, and then a very muscular pyloric canal. And this is the duodenal bulb, so we've entered the duodenum here. All right? What's weird about that? Peritoneum connects right there. And so duodenal bulb is intraperitoneal. 
the rest of the duodenum is extraperitoneal, right? That's always weird about the duodenum. And then it comes back up, and then we have that duodenal jejunal flexure. It goes back in the peritoneum right there. Jejunum is intraperitoneal. All right. So, unfortunately for you, well, it's not too bad, but pathologists and histologists, they have a different way of categorizing things. I like this, though. This marker's kind of cool. Um, yeah. So, the cardia is still the same, but the fundus now includes the entire body and the fundus. So when you're talking about in physiology and you're talking about histology and pathology, this there's no such thing as the body anymore. It's all the fundic region. How come? Because fundic glands live in all of this region. This is where the fundic glands live. right? And then this is one region. It's just called the antral region. Antral region. Sometimes they call it the pyloric region, but there's no canal or because we have pyloric glands that live here, right? So that's kind of the, the deal with that. Uh, so as I just said, in the histological world and pathological world, I didn't. I should write down the time too because I... I'm using my master slides and I don't want to go crazy here. All right, so in the pathology pathology world, histology world, as I just said, um, there's only those breakdowns I just said. The cardiac region is still the same thing. It has cardiac glands in there. Uh, very boring. This is the last time I'll talk about this. It secretes mucus and that's it. It doesn't do anything else for us. Fundic region, we'll talk about this region all the time. So uh, it makes up, it's the largest glandular region of the stomach, makes up 80%. It includes the fundus and body, contains fundic glands. You could say it's between the cardia and the pyloric region. And then we have the pyloric, that's the second biggest glandular region. Uh, that contains pyloric glands. Sometimes they're called antral glands, but most of the time they're pyloric glands. All right, It contains a real physiological sphincter, the pyloric sphincter, which is strong enough to be classified as a real sphincter. Okay, cardiac region is here, everything I said, nice picture. Showing you, this is what, so when I say the fundic region of the stomach, from now on, I'm not talking anatomical. I'm including the fundus up here. Got it? Okay, this is kind of a weird, no stars even on this slide, which is pretty rare, but in case you ever hear, this is always a little confusing. So, ORAD, what does that mean, ORAD? Um, so that means they're talking about the cardiac region and the fundic region, basically the proximal half. The proximal half is closest to the esophagus, and the distal half is further away from the esophagus. The distal half is called the caudal area of the stomach. Proximal half is called the orad portion of the stomach. Right? And that's passive, right? That we'll talk, Did we talk about that? Um, I can't remember if I took those slides out. Um, but the fundus, fundic region in the stomach, doesn't do much churning up of food. Yeah, we did talk about that, I think. Right? And then it's that caudal area of the stomach that mixes and grinds the food up. All right, stomach glands. Now, oh yeah, we're, I'm going to go through this a little bit, but a lot of the stuff is on YouTube and I cut out. But we need to talk about them a little bit so you can understand uh, Zola, like ZE syndrome, which we're going to talk about in a bit. So stomach glands, a uh, little confusion here on this. So stomach glands, the way I'm going to use it, that means all the glands in your stomach. It means the cardiac glands in the cardiac region. 
It means the fundic glands in the fundic region, pyloric glands in the pyloric region. Sorry, I'm trying to fight a yawn off. I don't know what time it is, like 9.30 at night here. Got behind today. Um, yeah, so those are the those are the three right there. So when I say stomach, if I want to talk about all of these collectively, I'll say stomach glands. So that seems pretty straightforward, right? Uh, but not all authors, in fact, some big authors, including Ross, they use the term gastric glands as the parent of all these glands. So why don't I use that? Because a whole bunch of authors use the word gastric gland as an AKA for fundic gland. So it can get really, really confusing when you're trying to put this story together. So to keep things simple, stomach glands mean cardiac, fundic, pyloric. I won't use a gastric gland, period. I just worry it might pop up on boards. So what are they talking about? Are they talking about this as the master category, in which has these subcategories, or is this an AKA for fundic glands? So hopefully, I'm not on that part of board writing questions, but they hopefully they'll stay away from that word because it's a terrible word. Stomach wall, we, I'm not going to talk about. We already talked about all of these layers when we talked about the esophagus. So I'll just go through them right here. So there's a mucosal layer. There's an epithelium, just like that mucosa is made up of. And there are some AKs for this mucosal layer, surface mucosa, gastric mucosa, mucosal surface, mucosal layer. It's the top layer. It's the one that's in contact with the acid. It's still got the three subdivisions. Epithelium, uh, there's a lamina propria and a muscularis mucosa. It's got blood vessels in it. And it's got nerves in it just like the esophagus. Submucosa, not very exciting. Still contains Meisner's plexus. The only weird one, if you remember your histology, is the muscularis layer, aka muscularis externae, aka muscularis propria. This has an extra layer. Uh, so uh, we have this weird oblique layer, which now shows up, and we don't have that anywhere in the intestines or in the esophagus. Uh, our Bach plexus is still contained in the muscularis uh, layer. And then the outer layer is the serosal layer. Right. And here's just a uh, kind of idea of where we're going. There's a fundic gland, it looks like. Uh, but there's a mucosa layer. Notice that the glandular layer of the entire stomach, whether you're in the pyloric region or the fundic region, the glands bottom out. They don't go into the submucosa. In fact, the muscularis mucosae is not penetrated by any of these stomach glands. And remember, inside these stomach glands, like this is a fundic gland, that's where we have parietal cells and chief cells uh, and such. So there's different types of cells within these stomach glands that secrete the juices that we need to talk about. Gastric pits, take a look at a gastric pit right there. So this is the lumen of the stomach up here, right? This is where your Big Mac is, or whatever you just ate today. I don't even know if McDonald's probably isn't open. Yeah, I bet the drive through is probably open. Uh, but that's the stomach, but the, uh, the pit is right here. So that's the communication between the lumen of the stomach and the stomach gland is the gastric pit. And they all have this. Pyloric glands have them. Cardiac glands have them. Fundic glands, they all have gastric pits. Okay. They connect to the isthmus of the, uh, the, isthmus of the stomach gland. Uh, so this region would be the isthmus in here. But I'm not going to get too much in it because I just took a lot of these out so I can be able to get more diseases put in. Uh, they're lined with mature epithelial cells. The, the cell type is simple columnar. We've talked about that before. And the only difference now in the stomach from the intestines is simple columnar as well. But in the intestines we have, they don't secrete mucus. We have to have a different type of cell there. We have goblet cells in the intestines that secrete mucus. 
the stomach, all of the epithelial cells secrete mucus, which is kind of weird. Okay, but gastric pits are included in the stomach gland. Got to talk about the amazing gastric mucosal barrier. So the stomach, of course, is lined with acid, right? You have acid in there. How in the world can the stomach, I mean, the esophagus can't handle the acid, right? Uh, the stomach can't handle it either, but uh, it can because all of its cells secrete mucus like crazy. All of those epithelial cells. So mucus protects the stomach from destruction of hydrochloric acid uh, and pepsin too. So without the the GMB, I'm going to talk about that gastric mucosal barrier a lot. Uh, pepsin and hydrochloric acid will just rip the stomach to pieces and cause ulcers, uh, PUD, peptic ulcer diseases. Anything that takes out the gastric mucosal barrier is um, is a cause of PUD, as we'll see. And you can you burn a hole through the stomach. I mean, you could. That's intraperitoneal. You can die. You can get peritonitis and septicemia real quick. Uh, who creates and maintains this gastric mucosal barrier? All of these mucose cells. Look at them. Here they are. We're going down. There's a gastric pit we just looked at in the stomach. Let's say it's a fundic gland here. But every single one of these, they're called mucose cells, is one of the words. They're still simple columnar cells. You could call them that or epithelial. But a good good word for them is mucose cells or foveolar cells. Uh, and they're special because every single one of them secretes mucus, which is really weird, right? We don't see that. In the esophagus, we had two types of glands that secreted mucus. The stomach, or in the rest of the intestine, we have glands that do that, goblet cells. Don't need them. There's not goblet cells in the stomach because they all, these foveolar cells secrete their own mucus. So no goblet cells. Also, another difference between, uh, they're both simple columnar, but the simple columnar of the intestine, they have microvilli. Remember they have those folds, they have villi and then microvilli, plaque circularis or semi, or um, valves of Kirtring is what those are also called. Make sure you know that one. Um, but yeah, so there's no microvilli. Uh, they don't have an apical cup at their surface. The um, the enterocytes, those are epi or these simple columnar cells are called enterocytes when the small intestine. And uh, the foveolar cells have this weird apical cup at the top, and the apical cup is filled with. That genes create a gene product called mucinogen. So they're filled with this mucinogen, which is released, and that mixes uh, uh, with mucus, or, or turns into mu mucin, and that combines with water. And you got yourself a sticky mucus, and that's basically what makes the gastric mucosal barrier. There's a really cool electron microscope of the area, and they look like little volcanoes, kind of dormant volcanoes, I think. But these are all foveolar cells. We're just seeing the top. We're not used to seeing this view. And there's a pit right there. So if you want to go in a gastric gland or fundic gland or pyloric gland, depending on where we are, go right through that hole if you're Ant-Man and you run down there and um, you'll be able to see all the cells. you probably get burned, right? you got acid coming out of those things. So all epithelial cells of the stomach um, they secrete mucus. We know that. Uh, that's not true, we said, of the intestine and esophagus. Got that already. Collectively, their mucus makes up the lion's share of the gastric mucosal barrier. Kind of a review slide, I guess. Uh, what stimulates them? Oh, we gotta, we got to know, right? Because they got to be stimulated to produce um, mucin. Mucinogen turns into mucin. And so... Acetylcholine is one thing that's released from Meissner's plexus. When you think about food, I think I took all that. I took all that stuff out about the. That's too much physiology, uh, but you think about food, you smell food, um, you you get a release of acetylcholine from the Meissner's plexus, parasympathetically, kind of run, 
and acetylcholine. We'll, we'll look at that in a little bit here, what it does. Uh, but amongst other things, it can bind with these foveolar cells and cause the release of mucus. Uh, there is another thing that stimulates the, them to release mucus, and that's PGE2. So that's prostaglandin E2, uh, both autocrine and paracrine style, and we'll look at that more in a bit. What holds them together? Um, I guess I could have taken this out too, but uh, junctional complexes. So we have junction JCs, junctional complexes uh, on the side. The junctional complexes that really hold cells together are the macula adherens and the zona adherens. Uh, those are desmosomes, the macula adherens. Um, the one that prevents things from leaking between cells are the tight junctions. I know we talked about that. They're also part of the JCs as well, prevent molecules from passing between cells. It's important because you don't want hydrochloric acid or pepsin seeping into the mucosa and submucosal layers. So tight junctions are really important. They can be overthrown though, as we'll see later on. Um, there's basically, these are enterocytes, but same type of um, JCs, junctional complex, tight junctions. Uh, so nobody acid will try to get in. It just bounces off normally. If it gets through here, which it does sometimes, uh, these adherens, zona adherens, MAC adherens, oh, it just rips right through there. Gap junctions, forget it. It just rips down here and it starts damaging tissue and there's blood down here. and Yeah, uh, but tight junctions are pretty good at stopping that. I think I said this, zone adherens and MAC adherens are not very good at preventing molecules from sneaking in. We said that. Their job is to hold things together. Seventh quarter, you know, who cares why I'm even bothering with this stuff? Well, desmosomes and hemidesmosomes, they are targets for two autoimmune diseases. The most deadly of these autoimmune diseases is something called pemphigus vulgaris, and it is nasty. It's an autoimmune disease disease, an autoimmune attack and inf subsequent inflammation against desmosomes which hold hold cells together right on their sides. And here's someone who is affected with pemphigus vulgaris, and you can see how infection can be a big problem. They have to use huge doses of, of corticosteroids to fight this, and um, yeah, it's, it's not a great disease to have. Talk about that more in seventh quarter. I have YouTube videos on that one, I think. Uh, mucocells, what else do we need? Uh, we need to know what they secrete. That's a perfect question for me. Blank, or all of the following are secreted from mucocells except blank. I can see the question now. Uh, so mucin, right? We need to make, or mucinogen, mucin. Uh, we need to make mucus to make the gastromucosal barrier. Here's one, another really important one for that gastric mucosal barrier is bicarbonate anion. Uh, so that's manufactured and secreted right out of the, uh, the foveolar cells. Very important. It neutralizes, you can grab a hydrogen right there uh, and it gets like a hydrogen sponge so it can soak up some of that extra acid that gets into the gastric mucosal barrier. And what else? Uh, this secretes PGE2. This is a weird one, too. These guys are secreted from the apical region. Remember, cell has an apical region is toward the top. This is the apical region up here uh, where the lumen of the gland is. Right, if that's a mucous cell. And then the basal lateral surface is down here. So that's where PGE2 comes out down here. Right, so it's a hormone, and it's a paracrine molecule. It's not secreted up inside of here. Uh, the mucus comes out of the mucigen cups or the apical cups, or sorry, the the mucin comes out of uh, mucinogen granules, which are located in the apical cups. When stimulated, they secrete mucinogen via exocytosis, which is converted to mucin, which is the backbone of mucus. It water, water follows it and makes a really stick, sticky and thick and cloudy type mucus. Uh, mucus also contains some glycoproteins and carbohydrates, which gives it that kind of cloudy look. 
uh, because the mucus is cloudy, um, it's called cloudy mucus. That's the gastric mucosal barrier is made up of a, v- a visible cloudy viscous mucus that's on the top. It's different than the thin mucus that's secreted by neck cells, which is which makes the food slippery. Uh, the mucus has a very high pH. It's very basic, uh, so it can neutralize some of that acid. And that's not true from the mucus neck cells, which secrete a slippery type mucus, as we'll see. Cloudy mucus is so sticky and thick that it sticks to the apical surface of the foveolar cells, except it has little gaps where you can still get the hydrochloric acid out, so it doesn't completely block the stomach glands off. Um, This mucus layer, of course, is called the gastric mucosal barrier. Same story for the intestines. There's an intestinal mucosal barrier, same kind of story, but it's more goblet cells are more responsible for that than the epithelial cells. Uh, it's about one millimeter thick. Goes, we said it doesn't completely block the stomach glands. So here's a nice slide I kind of like. So these are just run of the mill uh, mucose cells uh, lining the stomach, and we can see what they secrete. So there's bicarbonate there. Uh, and it secretes mucus here, right? So it keeps a nice gastric mucosal barriers be right about here. And that there's your hamburger right there, your Big Mac. Draw my drawing skills. That's your hamburger. Okay. And let's not forget way down here, there's PG2 being secreted, not out of the apical surface, out of the basolateral surface swims and it binds to its neighbors. It also swims and binds to itself. And it causes this, it's called autocrine action when it binds to itself. And it causes the stimulation of more bicarbonate and mucus. I like this little marker, although I'm kind of getting ahead of my slides. What does it do? Forms a protective barrier. We said that already. Uh, authors call it the gastric mucosal barrier. That's from Guyton, a board book. Some call it the gastroduodenal mucosal bicarbonate barrier. That's like ridiculous. That's too long to be on a test question, I think. But nevertheless, I mean, it is an AKA for it. Gastric mucosal barrier is good, though. Bicarbonate, we said, already is released from the apex of mucose cells. Uh, potassium ion uh, as well. It gets incorporated into the mucus gel mix, and it neutralizes acid. It converts hydrochloric acid into water and CO2. Uh, this CO2, anybody who's had an upstep stomach can start burping like crazy if you over-secrete too much acid. Uh, you start making more CO2, and that's uh, one form of burping. All right, so the secretion of bicarbonate is super important for the gastric mucosal barrier. Here's a kind of a physiology slide here, but we can see bicarbonate being secreted. And it's, here's an ion, a hydrogen ion, snuck in through the gastric mucosa bear. It's getting too close. Uh, it needs to be taken out. So it binds bicarbonate ion, uh, and it ultimately forms carbonic acid, which dissociates into water and CO2. And CO2 is a gas, and you burp that up. Just another picture showing you what this... Remember, it's only about one millimeter thick, so there it is there. And then see how it kind of peters out. It doesn't go all the way down into these pits. Uh, you can also see how... These are the epithelial layer, but you can we can see um, how well innervated this is, the lamina propria here. We'll get to those cells. Mucus neck cells, I probably could have taken this out, but uh, mucus neck cells, they are in the neck of the stomach gland, and they secrete a mucus as well. But this mucus is different. It's almost acidic in some cases, but it's it's not cloudy, and it's very thin and watery, but it's thought, and they're not 100% sure what the deal is with it, um, but it does. It's thought to kind of get in the chyme in the food when it first comes down, 
and make it really slippery. And therefore, it can easily pass out the pyloric canal and out the pyloric sphincter. And here's the mucous neck cells right here, and they secrete thin mucus. As you uh, get up higher, you have the surface mucosa cells. These guys are being ratcheted out, too. I took all those slides out. But remember your physiology, how there's stem cells in here that are giving birth to these guys. And these all these cells are getting ratcheted. Mucous neck cells eventually will be ratcheted up and they'll turn into mature surface mucus cells as they go up here. Uh, when they're freshly born, they secrete a different type of mucus. Right? And we got chief cells. So what kind of gland is this if we got chief cells here? Well, if I told you that, you'd know. Parietal cells, so this is a fundic gland, right? Oxentic glands, AKA for fundic gland. There's the parts, we got the isthmus, we got the neck and the base. And then gastric pit is up here. There's the Big Mac up here, okay. Prostaglandin E2, so that is a signaling molecule. It is called a local hormone because it does swim. You can also call it a paracrine as well. It's secreted from the mucosa cells and not secreted into the lumen. It's released from the basal lateral region or the bottom of the cells, we said. Right down here. Um, and it can get into the bloodstream if you want. Um, but again, it it hits the self and it hits the neighbor and it stimulates them to release bicarbonate and mucus self-stimulating does something else too uh, it does it binds to something else anybody remember what that is from physiology i'll tell you in a minute um, so here's what we said it's autocrine and paracrine once in the interstitium it swims over and binds to itself so that's an example of autocrine signaling and then it binds to its neighbor cells. And what does it do? It stimulates to do what? It stimulates the mucose cells or foveolar cells or simple columnar cells, whatever you want to call them, stimulates those foveolar cells to do its thing. And its thing is to release bicarbonate. Um, yep, to release bicarbonate and mucus. Did I have, I have mucus in here? Where'd mucus go? Mucus cells to release and create bars carbonate. Uh, also binds. So here's the other thing it does. It also swims over and it binds to a ECL cell. That's called enterochromophin-like cell. Enterochromophin-like cells. And they are super important because here's the most powerful stimulator of acid right here. Histamine. Histamine is super powerful. Where does it histamine? Now, this is the type 2 histamine, H2 histamine. Where does it come from? It comes from enterochromophin-like cells. What stimulates its release? A bunch of things, a couple things. Um, but one uh, is, well, it doesn't stimulate its release. PGE2 actually can bind to ECLs, but it doesn't stimulate its release. It actually inhibits its release. Uh, it's not a super powerful mechanism, I should say, but it, it does... It does stimulate, it inhibits the release of histamine. If you inhibit the release of histamine, well, then you're not going to bind to, here's a parietal cell. There's a little hydrogen ion maker, right? So if histamine decreases, then you're going to inhibit the release of hydrochloric acid. So ECL cells indirectly inhibit the release of hydrochloric acid when they're secreted. Why would you want to inhibit the release of hydrochloric acid? Well, what's the job of what's the job of this its daddy, its parent? Its parent's a mucose cell. Its parent is to make the gastromucosal barrier. So to help the gastromucosal barrier, this is the, the evildoer of the gastromucosal barrier, its arch enemy. Uh, so it inhibits the arch enemy from wrecking the gastromucosal barrier. That's kind of the mechanism there. I probably just got way ahead of my slides again. Uh, but here's the here's the mechanism. So PGE2 is released. It inhibits ECLs. That decreases histamine, decreases the production of hydrochloric acid. 
PGE2 turns around and stimulates itself right here. Autocrine, so you release mucin and you release bicarbonate. I just put them side by side, but each cell releases both bicarbonate and mucin. Okay, and we said already ACH from the uh, enteric nervous system can also stimulate these foveolar cells to release bicarbonate and mucin as well. All right, there's just an example of autocrine signaling. And yeah, the cells, their little vesicles are releasing this out. Basal lateral surface, it swims in the interstitium. And it, oh, look, it's a binding site on itself. So it's self-stimulating autocrine signaling. Same kind of deal. This is paracrine signaling. Uh, the, the hormone is made, or the ligand, right? That's another name for a hormone. Make sure you know ligand. It swims to its neighbor and binds to that um, and stimulates some type of action. So that's paracrine signaling. All right, I didn't take this out. We got to know this. I think you're pretty good with this. So uh, prostaglandin PGE2 uh, versus COX versus NSAIDs. Uh, so in order to release PGE2, because we said we just talked about PGE2 coming out the basal lateral surface of foveolar cells, so it can't come out. It needs an enzyme to to birth it. It's so. The enzyme are the cyclooxygenases, specifically COX-1. COX-2 can do it as well, but it's more COX-1 is kind of the star of the show there. So classically COX-1, which is everywhere in many cells in the body, um, that's the one that is crucial for, that makes PGE2 in foveolar cells. And remember um, that PGE2 will turn off acid. That's an important concept in this little story here. PGE2 binds to ECL cells, turns them off, turns off the release of histamine, decrease histamine. It's going to decrease hydrogen ion release, and that's going to kind of beef up the gastric mucosal barrier by eliminates, eliminating it. It's arch enemy. Hydrogen ion. Okay, COX-2 is also swimming around in mucosal cells in the cytosol, but it normally is not involved in making PGNA2. Uh, cyclooxygenase 1 and 2 uh, are both involved in this. You're going to treat hundreds of the, these over your careers. Uh, don't let the purple scare you. It doesn't always mean there's a fracture. It doesn't always mean there's an avulsion. You'll see plenty of that purple. But uh, both those cyclooxygenases are involved in inflammation. We need inflammation, right? There's going to be dead tissue that needs to be cleaned up. We need to bring in the troops to clean that mess up. The trouble with inflammation, it just, in the body, it just goes too crazy. It, w way too much inflammation. I don't know why the committee designed it like that, but it's kind of a, everybody has too much inflammation, it seems. Um, but yeah, so how do you stop an unwanted, out-of-control inflammation process that's, that should be better, and it's, it's not? Uh, well, besides our therapy, low-volt muscle stem, uh, or maybe some Russian current with ice, some PNF exercise, stuff like that. Uh, but you can also, to help, if you're working with athletes and need to get them back, they'd probably be taking some NSAIDs on top of what you do. So classically, the ones we can buy over the counters are the COX-1s, uh, like Advil or ibuprofen, sodium naproxen, Aleve. There's good prescription ones, very strong ones. Volteron is a really strong one that's been around for a long time. These will rip up your stomach, though, right? We all know that, and we're going to find out why right now. Uh, so NSAIDs are absorbed mainly in the small intestine. Uh, they can be their acids. Now they're acid base, so they can irritate the stomach if you don't eat them with food. So you want to have these things with food. So get them into the small intestines, they'll be absorbed and they circulate throughout the body. Uh, they will find the inflammation and they will bind to cyclooxygenase 1, which is involved in the, cas uh, the inflammatory cascade. And it knocks out inflammation and pain and swelling by binding to COX-1. And 
slowing this down. Although you got COX-2 still working the inflammation, so maybe COX-2 is better. If you really want to go big, uh, you use some type of steroid, which nips the chain way up at the top, as we'll see. Um, but yeah, specifically, it turns off PGE2 secretion in the inflammation process as well. Right? Um, yeah, so great. But some of you are thinking, well, it's not so great because NSAIDs uh, also knock out COX-1, which, which is in the foveolar cells. Right? We said we have to have COX-1 to make PGE2 which is important for keeping our gastric mucosal barrier strong, right? So you see the problem by knocking or decreasing PGE2 production because uh, if your COX-1 inhibitor knocks out COX-1 in the inflammation, great, but it knocks out COX-1 in your foveolar cells, so you can't make PGE2. If you can't make PGE2, there goes your bicarbonate. Uh, and there goes your mucus. You have decreased bicarbonate release, so that's going to hurt the gastric mucosa barrier. It can't absorb acid anymore. It's also going to decrease the mucus release, mucin release. Uh, so you're going to, instead of one millimeter, now it's going to be a half a millimeter. Uh, so acid can easily get through there, right? And then if that's not enough, without PGE2, your histamine production is going to be higher from the ECL cells, and histamine is the most powerful stimulator of acid. Histamine will bind to the parietal cell, H2 receptors, and it binds to um, chief cells as well and stimulates the release of pepsinogen, which is converted into pepsin. And yeah, so you get physically damages the gastric mucosal barrier, and you get too much acid, and yeah, acid rips up your stomach, and you got this pepsia. So increase hydrochloric acid plus pepsin and decrease gastric mucosal barrier strength will lead to some symptoms eventually. NSAIDs are notorious for causing stomach upset, and they can get to the point where they cause ulcers in people. Uh, but they cause dyspepsia, that's stomach upset. We'll talk a lot about that. Uh, dyspepsia, what causes dyspepsia? That would be the gastropathies, which we will talk about, the dreaded gastropathies, including gastritis. Uh, the, it'll cause GERD. If you have too much acid around, you start burping that up. You could get a Barrett's esophagus from that. Gastritis isn't treated. Problem isn't fixed. You can burn a hole in your stomach lining and get an ulcer. Uh, you can also burn a hole in the... In fact, it's more common for an a ulcer to form in the small intestine than in the stomach. Uh, those are both peptic ulcer disease. That pepsin is really bad. Excess pepsin is really bad at causing, at ripping up the stomach and do a dental wall. Here's the gastric ulcer in the body of a stomach. Person had came in with back pain. They've been on NSAIDs for a year. And yeah, there's a juicy uh, looking pud there, peptic ulcer disease. That's a peptic ulcer. All right, what about cyclooxygenase 2? Is that better for inflammation? Uh, well, it's better in the sense that COX-2, the enzyme cyclooxygenase 2, although it is around in the foveolar cells of the stomach, it doesn't work. It doesn't do much usually. Uh, so if you knock it out, COX-1 is still going to be making your PGE2, so you don't have to worry. And COX-2 can certainly still hit that inflammatory cascade. Uh, again, COX-1, you ideally want something to knock out COX-1 pathway and the COX-2 pathway. Um, but nevertheless, if you want to save your stomach and go on NSAIDs long-term, you want cyclooxygenase 2, uh, COX-2 inhibitor, such as, who knows COX-2? Best COX-2 in the planet used to be something called Viox. Uh, back when I was still training, we used to use that stuff, and that was great anti-inflammatory. But uh, we'll see in a second why they pulled it off the market. Celebrex is the one I'm thinking of. And for whatever reason, Celebrex isn't causing the blood clotting problem, causing heart attacks and things like that. Uh, great lecture by uh, a professor here. Uh, you can, if you really want to get into it. He could have went maybe a little deeper, but it was a really good lecture. Uh, so I threw it up here 
Um, so you injure a cell, you sprain your ankle or whatever, you're going to injure blood vessels, microcirculation, and on the cell membrane, you have yourself these phospholipids, right? And the tail, uh, the, I think he said 20 molecules. I haven't checked that one to make sure, but uh, the fatty acid here uh, is what can give rise to arachnodonic acid. Uh, so phospholipids, really a fatty acid if you want to get technical. That's the first step in the inflammatory cascade. And by the way, prednisone and other glucocorticoids, they inhibit this first formation. So they don't let any of this stuff happen. Um, so that's just the way it is. It's, it's powerful, but it's kind of using a shotgun when you, you don't want to kill everything off. So let's follow the prostaglandin over here. So the arachnidonic, ox, arachnidonic acid is converted into prostaglandin. In fact, many different types of prostaglandins do all these things. Uh, but prostaglandins uh, call in the troops. They call in inflammation, which sometimes is needed. Uh, they cause pain. They cause fever. They increase the gastric mucosal barrier. Uh, they cause blood clotting, thromboxane production, and platelet aggravation. Um, so these guys, that's what they do. This side, uh, which is which is ruled by the COX-1 enzyme, uh, and different prostaglandins do different things here. Uh, but that's why if you get a COX-1 inhibitor, uh, like aspirin, ibuprofen, um, they inhibit this top step, and therefore you get decreased inflammation, decreased pain, decreased fever, if that's the problem, uh, and decreased gastric... Oh, we don't want that. Do we get decreased production of PG&E2? No, we don't want that. And that's the problem with COX-1s because that's going to cause the whole thing we already talked about. Um, and then they decrease blood clotting. though. No, that's a good thing. You know, they decrease uh, platelet aggravation. So that's where the half aspirin comes in, right? Half aspirin also can cause, rip up your stomach too, but it can cut inflammation and it, it can kind of cut back on any micro type of uh, blood clotting or thrombosis formation. Psychooxygenase COX-2 runs through this pathway, right? It also, uh, COX-2 enzymes working in with other types of prostaglandins can also make inflammation, pain, fever. Uh, synovial fluid rheumatoid arthritis uh, is based through this COX-2 system. And decrease, this is the weird thing, though, decrease platelet aggravation. Um, so that's a good benefit uh, of this COX-2 pathway. But you get a COX-2 inhibitor like Celebrex or uh, Celecoxibin. Uh, you snuff it out here, then you, uh, so all of these are increased. You decrease the inflammation, decrease pain, decrease fever, decrease synovial fluid, but you increase platelet aggravation. And that's the problem with some of the COX-2 enzymes. Uh, this guy right here, you don't want clotting going, especially in the coronary arteries and in the noodle in the brain. Get a stroke or heart attack. Uh, so a lot of the COX-2s were removed. Uh, Celebrex, however, has not, for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to have that function. So that's interesting. Uh, Tylenol is an interesting one, too. Um, he mentioned uh, this is thought to work on a COX-3 pathway, although there's not enough evidence for sure for that to be the case. But it's kind of an anti-inflammatory. It knocks out pain and fever. It's terrible with inflammation. It's not going to help your inflammation a problem at all. But it'll, it's good for pain and fever. But it doesn't affect the stomach at all. Uh, and it doesn't affect clotting at all. So it's a more narrow approach just to pain and fever. And, and it works on both pathways as well. All right, and we won't get into the leukotriene pathway, but um, you can, I should have put his name, I keep forgetting to do that, but um, you can learn more about it there. You guys probably know this stuff already. All right, now this is the spot, much to the cheering of students. Um, I've taken this out. This is really complicated stuff, and I don't know what's going to happen to your physiology scores, uh, but I really suggest that you watch this video because I, from what people told me before, you guys need this. 
Um, but I don't, This, I mean, it's kind of my realm because there's some hormones in it, so I could justify it, but I need to get to more pathology and less of this physiology, pathology stuff. Uh, so go to this video, watch this video, and study that video. I'm not going to test you on it um, like I used to. Uh, but students did not do good on this stuff. This was what really dropped the grades back when we were testing like normal. So that tells me that you're really weak on this stuff, right? So somatostatin, what's that do? Uh, what's the difference between fundic somatostatin uh, and pyloric somatostatin? See, that stuff, you got to know that kind of stuff. Anyway, uh, we will do a little bit of this, though. Um, so stomach, because we need to talk about stomach glands a little bit. There's three main types of glands. We said kind of already. There's cardiac glands that secrete mucus. There's fundic glands. It's very strong, a.k.a. is oxentic glands. Probably 50-50 shot. You might see oxentic on boards. You might see fundic. You might see it on my test. Uh, so you got to know that's a really strong a.k.a. That's a horrible a.k.a. gastric glands. I won't use it. And then pyloric glands. Uh, they are named because... They, they are located in the histological regions where they came from. Uh, so cardiac glands come from the cardiac region, secrete mucus. Fundic glands come from the fundic region, but remember we're in pathology now. So fundic region includes the body of the stomach. Okay, Pyloric glands are still the pyloric antral region, and that's where they come from. All right, so I cut tons out here, but I still left this just to give you just to be able to talk. I guess I am going to test you on some of this stuff, but I'm just not going to go spoon feed it to you because you should already know this from GI physiology. Um, so we have two glands that are the star of the shows. We have the fundic glands or oxentic glands, and we have the pyloric glands, which are living the pyloric anthem. Um, so fundic glands, think of, I think I actually left this in, hip, the hipster. What they secrete, what do fundic glands secrete? Hydrochloric acid, intrinsic factor, and pepsinogen, right? So chief cells secrete pepsinogen. They live usually deeper down in the oxentic gland, right? And then we have parietal cells usually are a little closer to the surface, but they can be down. There's one right there. Uh, parietal cells, they secrete hydrochloric acid an intrinsic factor. Pepsin in the hip, remember that comes from the chief cells. Okay, uh, we have some enterochromophin, uh, enterochromophin cells in here. Uh, we won't worry about those now. There's D cells, so there's fundic D cells and pyloric D cells um, are in here as well. Those are inhibitors, right? They turn off acid production. Actually, we'll look at here this in a second. Oh, there's the hipster. So Google, I, I Googled hipster, and this is a hipster according to Google. Uh, so remember, hipster, H-I-P, hipster, the parietal, or fundic gland. Hipsters are fun, fundic gland, fun hipsters, fundic gland. That's the stuff that comes out. Hydrochloric acid comes out parietal cells, which are still in fundic glands. Intrinsic factor comes out parietal cells as well, still inside fundic glands. Pepsinogen converted to pepsin pretty quickly, comes out of chief cells. All of these guys are in these uh, fundic glands, aka oxentic glands. Got it? Remember that stuff? G cells pretty simple. These pyloric glands, they only have one. And notice, let's go back here, uh, these guys... All of these guys are secreted into the lumen. They're secreted out the apex, apical surface. That's not true with pyloric glands. Uh, the star of the show in pyloric glands is the G cell. G for what? Gillard? No. Gastrin. They secrete gastrin. But they don't secrete it. Here's the lumen right here. They don't secrete it into the lumen. They secrete it into the interstitium. Uh, and it jumps into the bloodstream. It swims, doesn't have to swim far, it jumps right into the bloodstream. And this is the first real hormone uh, that we've talked about so far. Our first disease we're going to look at is with gastrin. Um, 
but uh, it's stimulated. One thing that stimulates is called ga uh, uh, GRP, gastrin releasing peptide, which comes out of Meisner's plexus from the enteric nervous system. So smelling that food, that Big Mac, seeing the Big Mac with your eyes and uh, the presence of the Big Mac in your stomach stimulates the enteric nervous system to release acetylcholine uh, to get the acid pumps and stuff going, but it also releases something called GRP, which swims over and stimulates the G-cell to release gastrin into the interstitium. Gastrin jumps in the bloodstream and flows all over the body, right? Um, but it flows over to the fundic region because remember we're in the pyloric region of the stomach. The fundic region of the stomach is where the fundic glands live. So it has to travel. It can't swim that far. Can't pericrine its way all the way to the fundic region of the stomach. It has to use the superhighway, the blood vessels. Uh, but it does. It jumps in the highways, a short drive. Uh, and then it jumps off and it does two things. Gastrin double stimulates uh, the release of hydrochloric acid, as well as intrinsic factor, I should say. It does so directly by binding to CCK2 receptors that are on parietal cells. Okay, CCK2 receptors are there. It does so indirectly by binding to ECL cells. Remember what we just talked about ECL cells. Who inhibits those again? Who inhibits? PGE, right? PGE2 inhibits. Now this will override PGE2 like nothing. Uh, gastrin will bind to this and stimulate the release of histamine, which powerfully binds to H2 receptors, also stimulates the release of hydrochloric acid uh, and intrinsic factor. So gastrin is a very powerful thing. It, would it be a good thing? And we won't get into the mechanisms. I won't test you on those, but go to that video and see how that stuff is regulated by the pH of the stomach is how gastrin is regulated because it can be shut off by somatostan. Um, but yeah, so that's the story. What was I saying? My train of thought. Uh, I forgot what it was saying. Uh, but anyway, that's how gastrin double stimulates the parietal cell. Uh, to release that. Okay. Oh, so I was going to say, would it be a good thing to have a tumor somewhere, like in your pancreas, that was a neuroendocrine tumor who liked to secrete not aldosterone, not ACTH? How about if it secretes gastrin? And there absolutely is such a thing. And we'll look at that syndrome here. Uh, if I can keep my eyes open long enough. Let's see, how are we doing on time? It seems like we're, we got a ways to go. See, now I would take a break if we were in school. We'd roam around, get a little fresh air, and come back. But soon, soon. I guess the we got an email from Dr. Snow, and he said that school is definitely still on this uh, lockdown until the 1st of June. So you should be getting that message soon. But that's actually the very last week of this quarter. So we might actually get one week with you guys. But I, I have a feeling we won't. Because that's not the Trump plan. Although Trump, I guess, is... Who, who knows? Too late to talk about that. So anyway, that's the deal with gastrin. So make sure you understand it double stimulates the parietal cell. Because I will test you. This slide is... Fair game. And you think this slide is way to see. Oh, I love this slide. Uh, so I spend about 90 minutes, no, about 90 slides worth, uh, that's about an hour and a half or so, talking about all this. Uh, but you're supposed to know this already, right? I've got I someone talked to me about this and said you can't teach them everything because they're supposed to already know this. So um, if you don't know this, go to my video and study this because I'm going to ask you questions on this. Uh, so here's the here's the Big Mac. Hamburger stimulates the vagus nerve by all those things we talked about to release ACTH or, or ACH, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine stimulates G-cells. Oh, another stimuli. 
So it's not only GRP, it's acetylcholine also stimulates gastrin or G cells. But we're in the antrum, right? Um, so these are uh, these are pyloric glands where the G cells are. G cells release gastrin. What does the gastrin do? It goes and binds to its CCK2 receptor to directly stimulate the release of acetylcholine or uh, uh, hydrochloric acid intrinsic factor. It also indirectly stimulates it by binding there. The plus means that it's stimulating it to release histamine, and that binds to H2 receptors and stimulates again the release of acid, everything we talked about. Um, it also shuts off these. I won't, I won't test you on these, I don't think, although you still need to know them on the D cells, but it, can, it also... Uh, it also can stimulate or shut these down as well. We won't get into those. All right. What else does ACTH do, though? It also, oh, look, it binds directly to parietal cells. That's another. So there's three. You should definitely know the three receptors on a parietal cell. H2 receptor for histamine. Now you got a CCK2 receptor for gastrin. And you got a muscarinic M3 receptor for acetylcholine. So that's why H2 blockers don't work, right? Because what about these other receptors, right? I, I, I swear it must be a placebo because I can't see how it could possibly work. All right, what else do I want to tell you on this? Well, we can talk about, see, there's how the whole thing's regulated by the pH. If the pH falls under 3.5, uh, that's getting pretty acidic we need to slow down the acid machinery right so that stimulates the d cells uh, to inhibit gastrin somatostatin is released it inhibits gastrin uh, or inhibits the g cells to say slow down the acid production right ph is falling too low and that's the way you shut it off by somatostatin stimulating g cells somatostatin also is a hormone jumps in the bloodstream and it swims over, binds to ECL cells, inhibits it, just like PG&E2 does, to stop making histamine. Uh, and it also it can directly bind to parietal cells and shut that off as well. Uh, so this, these are antral D cells do this. This is antral somatostatin. Okay, fundic somatostatin is a little bit different. It's not affected by hydrogen ion at all. Okay. So know that stuff. That should be easy for you, right? I know it's not. But all right. So I skipped 90 slides. Here we go. Zollinger Ellison syndrome, ZE syndrome. Let's talk about this and then I'm going to bed. ZE syndrome uh, or Zollinger Ellison syndrome. Patient has developed, guess what? A neuroendocrine tumor that over secretes gastrin. It's an ectopic tumor. What does that mean? It ectopically secretes gastrin. Well, we already talked about a couple examples of that. But ectopically means it's secreting gastrin uh, from a, a spot distant to its native land. Its native land is usually the pancreas. So usually ZE syndrome is caused by a pancreatic gastrinoma. Pancreatic gastrinoma. So it's a tumor secreting gastrin that lives in the pancreas. Uh, about 10% of the time, uh, it is a duodenal gastrinoma where the tumor is in the duodenum and secreting gastrin, not into the lumen, but it's into the bloodstream, into the interstitium. Pretty good with that. What's the sequelae? Well, now that we've you kind of we've refreshed our physiology, uh, if you have too much gastrin in the blood, it's going to overstimulate the parietal cells and you're going to have an overproduction of hydrochloric acid. So directly it binds to, we don't have to go through this, do we? CCAK, CCK2 receptors in the parietal cells, that stimulates acid production. Indirectly binds to ECL cells, which causes histamine. Histamine binds to H2 receptors 
stimulates the release of parietal cells or stimulates parietal cells to release acid. Bottom line, ZE syndrome causes way too much acid to be released all the time. These tumors, there's no way to shut these off. Somatostatin does not work. They don't have receptors for somatostatin, so you can't shut it down. So you can have huge levels. So if you do a blood test, what do you think you'll see in the blood? High levels of gastrin, right? Now, clinically, how will they present? Uh, well, they'll have too much acid, way too much acid. What's a word for too much acid? Hyperchlorhydria is the way that you say too much hydrochloric acid. Hyperchlorhydria. Guarantee that's on the test, so make sure you know that word. Okay. They'll also have GERD. Why would they have GERD? They have too much acid around. They're burping it up too much. Could go into Barrett's esophagus. That could turn into esophageal carcinoma. They'll have PUD, peptic ulcer disease. Why will they have that? Too much acid around in the stomach. It burn, burn a hole in the, the mucosa if there's too much acid. It gets into the duodenum, burns a hole in that. You could have a, that's a PUD, is peptic ulcer disease. It could be, that, that means there's an ulcer in the duodenum or in the stomach. What about histology? How if you're going to look at, the pathologist is going to take a sample of your tummy. What's it going to look like? Well, just like left ventricular hypertrophy or anything else, the parietal cells, they're overstimulated. They're going to become hypertrophic. They're going to become muscular. They're not dysplastic. They're not going to become cancerous or anything like that or metaplastic, they're not going to morph into new tissue, but they're going to get big, and there's going to be too many of them, and it's going to make the rugae look gigantic, as we'll see in a second. Uh, okay, overstimulates the ECAL cells as well, uh, So, because it binds to them and it binds to parietal cells. So those are all way too big. And then you have way too much acid, right? Acid will get into the small intestine and start to change some of the intestinal mucosa as well and, and damage the barrier. So what do you think the symptoms will be? Well, they're going to have an upset stomach because it's going to be irritated by all that acid overproduction. So that's called dyspepsia. Or abdominal, they got tummy ache, abdominal pain. 75% of them have in studies. Uh, why do they have diarrhea? Well, what do the intestinal enterocytes do? Well, a huge job is to reabsorb water. Remember, they're kind of like the principal cells. They suck up so sodium and water. Uh, but if they're irritated from acid irritates them and they get mad, they're not going to work. They're sick. They quit. They're taking a sick day. And therefore, where's all that water go? It goes right out your rear end and you have diarrhea. Peptic ulcer disease. Uh, well... Too much acid is going to cause peptic ulcer disease. But not only that, the peptic ulcers are in really strange places, uh, like the jejunum or even the ileum. It's unheard of. Uh, that's a sign that they got ZE syndrome. I see pet ulcers that far down. And then, of course, you have GERD and Barrett's esophagus and possibly cancer. Diarrhea, we just talked about that. Acid damages the enterocytes, and they say, I'm not going to do it anymore, and that causes diarrhea. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention, uh, so the low interstitial pH deactivates pancreatic lipase, right? We need lipase to break down fats. So guess what? You can't break down that the, all the fat in that Big Mac you just ate or that steak with all the fat on it or that bacon you had this morning. Um, so where does it go? It goes right out right out the rectum, right out uh, in fecal material, and you get a fatty-looking stool, which is called steratorrhea. Strat, stratorrhea, or st st sorry, st strat. Thinking of my strat guitar sitting right there I'm looking at. Uh, steorrhea. Steatorrhea. <laughs> I read my sign here. Stea, or steatorrhea. Steatorrhea. Steatorrhea, fatty stool, gross picture warning, I bet. Oh, there it is. That's what I need to see at this hour. Steatorrhea. All right, uh, the natural history. Uh, so it's kind of weird. It can go into remission sometimes. I said strange ulcers in weird places, right? To Junum and uh, Duodenum. Uh, HP infections, forget it. 
Uh, the acid, HP loves acid, but HP doesn't like this much acid. It can kill off HP, uh, so you won't get uh, HP. There are four classic findings. We kind of said these already. Hypergastronemia. You do blood work, you're going to have too much gastrin in the blood. Uh, you're going to have gastric acid hypersecretion. So, yeah, why didn't I just put hyperchlorhydria there? I don't know, but you can certainly add, because I'm not going to say gastric acid hypersecretion. Uh, Actually, that's going to be my first note, if I can find my pen. 415. Let's change that to uh, hyperchlorhydria. Hyperchlorhydria. Okay. Uh, and then you get a peptic ulcer disease, which doesn't respond well to treatment. You get it better and it comes back. Get it better and it comes back. It's another sign of it. Uh, and then, of course, we talked about the uh, cells who are getting hit by the gastrin, the parietal cells and ECL cells. They're going to get all buff and burly, uh, so they're hyperplastic. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at this on endoscope. Uh, so the rugae, because of all the, uh, the hypertrophy, uh, they get really, really big looking. And it looks scary because lymphoma and Mentrier's disease can also Mentrier's disease can also look just like this. I cut all those slides out because just don't have enough time to get into all that stuff. It's more rare. Uh, lymphoma is not really my area. I don't know who teaches the cancer. I always wondered about who who teaches blood, uh, all the cancers and all the different. I, I try to get a little bit of that, but I don't think you guys get too much of that. But anyway. Um, yeah, so histological examination, just by observing, you got these gigantic-looking rugae, five times bigger than normal. The parietal cells are. There's more of them. Um, let's take a look. There's normal rugae. Uh, look how skinny they are. And here is someone, ZE syndrome. Look how big those things are. It's a little closer image, too, but they're just gigantic rugae, going all the way down into the pyloric antrum here. Uh, so... Yep. Uh, how do you treat it? Well, a lot of times you can't even find it. These tumors can be the size of a pea, uh, or even a BB, and they can cause all kinds of trouble. So you just have to treat it like GERD, H2 blockers, PPIs mainly, uh, lifestyle adjustment, right is wrong, all that stuff. Uh, try to find the tumor, the PET scan, an ultrasound. Scintig What's scintigraphy? What's the more common name for that? bone scan. So look for that tumor. If you can find it, you can operate on it and take it out. But the pancreas, you don't want to mess with that pancreas, right? You can't replace your pancreas. You die uh, with that thing. So a lot of times you're just stuck treating the, uh, the overproduction of acid. Hey, we did it. All right, pernicious anemia is next week. So I owe you two more lectures on CVPP for tomorrow. And we'll see you tomorrow.